Hello, and welcome to the Sailing and Cruising the East Coast of the United States podcast. I'm Bela Musitz. And I'm Mike Wasserman. Hey, Mike, back in episode 83, excuse me, uh, back in episode 83, we interviewed uh, Peter Gibbons' Neff. And what we talked about was he was getting ready uh, to sail in something called the Mini Transat, which is a race across the Atlantic Ocean in a 21-foot sailboat. And this was sort of his preparation and what he was going through and stuff. Well, this episode is all about his experience in that race. Uh, yes, indeed, he did uh, accomplish that race. Uh, it was a super interesting story. He had, of course, some great things to say and a great experience in doing it. So uh, that's what this episode is all about. Cool. Yeah, I know. I remember really well the first interview with Peter, and it was awesome. So I really can't wait to hear what's next. Should we get right into the interview? Yeah, let's do that, Mike. But before we do that, uh, I want to say a special thanks to our supporters. Uh, there are several listeners who have been supporting the podcast via Patreon for quite a while now. Uh, and we really want to send them a special thank you. And if you would like to join them, uh, you can do so by going to patreon.com forward slash sailing the east. Yeah, right. You are, Bella, as usual. And listeners, thanks for your support. Um, and now let's dive right into today's discussion with Peter Gibbons Neff about the mini transat. Peter, welcome to the podcast again. So great to see you. Hi, Bella. Thanks for having me on again. Really appreciate it. Yeah, sure. So last time you were on, uh, if our listeners remember the previous episode, and I should know the number, and I will dig that up while we're chatting here, uh, but you were preparing for the uh, mini Transat, uh, which is a race across the Atlantic, but it's not your ordinary race across, sailboat race across the Atlantic. It's kind of unique. So can you give us a little bit of uh, uh, what the mini Transat is? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, so a lot has happened. I think we were, I was looking it up. We were talking, I think, this time last year uh, around June time frame. So, yeah, I've set a lot of miles since then. Um, but the Mini Transat, essentially, it's a solo ocean race across the Atlantic Ocean uh, in two stages, but it's on 21 foot boats and it's unassisted uh, on these high performance little boats designed for offshore racing. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's basically the background behind it, but there's a lot that goes into it, um, which I'm sure we'll get into. Uh, but yeah, it, it, it's, you know, it's mini, not because of the length, but because of the size of the boat, but it's a full <laughs> on 4,000 mile race across the Atlantic. Right, right. Mini describes the boat, not the distance. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> or the skill required. So, uh, in order to do something like this, you just can't show up with a boat and say, I'm going to do this. Right. So there's sort of a qualifying process. Take us through that again. Definitely. So the, the qualifying process for this is it can take anywhere from two to three years to fully qualify for it. Um, based off the rules, you have to do a 1,000 mile solo sail and they have two courses, one in the Atlantic, one in the Mediterranean. And then if you're somewhere farther away from that, you could request a spe specific you know, thousand mile qualifier. Um, but essentially you have to do that by yourself. And then you also have to do uh, 1,500 miles of racing within the class mini. Uh, whether that's in the west coast of France, down to Spain, in uh, Italy, uh, there's a couple. There's some races throughout each season for that. Uh, but the the hard part about it is one, there's so many people wanting to do these these races that just because you sign up for five races in a season, you might only get into one or two nowadays. Mm. Whereas that wasn't the case just a couple of years ago. Uh, and then the other problem is there's a limit on the number of boats that can do the mini transat. So for this past edition, it was 90 boats. But when the registration opened nine months before the start of the race, 150 boats signed up for it. So when you have 150 boats sign up, they determine who's qualified. Basically, who qualifies the, uh, the soonest gets that first spot and it goes from there. Uh, so the boats that qualified that were on the bottom of the list uh, on the, the boats I was racing against, and we'll get into the different series and protos, but on the series side of things, um, they had double the number of qualification miles of races. So even though the requirement was 1,500, they had over 3,000 miles of racing in the class. Um, and most of those races are anywhere from 200 miles to 600 miles. And then uh, there's also one race from France to the Azores and back. And so that's 2,600 miles. So um, if you don't do that France to the Azores race, you have to do a lot of these smaller 400, 500 mile races for them to add up. And you have to do that in time to qualify 
um, basically before the season of the mini transat even starts. Um, so that's why it takes about two to three years to, to qualify. Yeah. Yeah. Holy cow. And so, uh, what races did you do to qualify? So, so let's see. So I started the races in 2021. And so I did, I think two races that first season plus my qualifying sale. Um, and those races had multiple legs on them. So it was probably more like four races essentially. Uh, and then I, so, and those races included things like off the West coast of France, Bay Biscay, um, up to the Normandy region. Uh, and then, uh, the second year I did races in similar area, Bay Biscay off the West coast of France. Um, but then that big race, uh, was from La Sable in France to the Azores and back. Um, so 2,600 miles. And we only had about two and a half days to rest and recover, uh, between wow. the two legs because the wind was so light for that first leg. <laughs> Wow. Uh, really a lot of endurance involved here. Absolutely. A lot of time out in the water. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the, the uh, talk about the boats. Are they all the same? Is it sort of a one design type of class? So within the, the class mini, you have the protos and the series. And all these boats are six and a half meters long or about 21 feet and then three meters wide. Um, and so it was a 9.8 feet. So they're all that same length and width. Uh, but then within the series class, um, these are more production style boats. So they're more highly regulated. Uh, so uh, let's see, um, fiberglass hulls, aluminum rigs. Um, you have to have Dacron main, mainsail and jib uh, and a set number of sails for, for both of them. But that's more the production. And for the production, they also have to build at least 10 of them. So you can't just build a one-off production boat out of fiberglass. Um, so that's one side of the class mini. The other side of the class mini is more of the developmental side and that's the prototypes so those are carbon fiber hulls um taller carbon fiber mast longer keels that are canting that are actually canting so you can switch the keel from side oh, wow. to side to help with the riding moment uh they have they can have water ballast um and so and they have a lot that's strictly a, a box rule so as long as you fit your your one-off prototype within that box rule you can have just about anything uh, so that part of it is more the developmental to try to push the boundaries of the class. Uh, and there's been a lot of change throughout sailing, not just in the minis, but some of the really good prototype minis have gone on to take those concepts that worked well into 30, 40, 50 foot boats. Um, so when you look at the class 40s, for example, a lot of the class 40s that are 40 feet, uh, they've taken some of the minis uh, concepts as well in the mochas, the 60 footer. So, um, those are the two different parts of the class mini and we're scored separately, but we all start on the starting line at the same time, which it. makes it fun. So you have just one start, all the boats starting, um, which plays into a lot of the strategy and tactics. Uh, I remember one of the starts, I was starting off next to one of the fastest prototypes. So now you got to deal with not just, you know, some of the boats might be different speeds on different points of sail. Um, so there's a lot that goes into it. Yeah. Uh, but even though they're two different parts of the class, we're all, part of the class mini. Um, a lot of sailors might start in the production boats for one mini transat, and then they might do a prototype for the next mini transat, or some sailors just stick with one or the other. Uh, but at, at the end of the day, we're all part of the class mini though. So it's a, it's a, it's a really interesting organization. Um, you know, it's built around these boats, but it's really founded in the people, the sailors, these solo sailors that are out there. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if I remember correctly, uh, you were doing this, not just, uh, because you wanted to do it, but you were sort of doing it for a cause uh talk about that a little bit definitely yeah so i was racing to raise awareness for u.s patriot sailing and that's a nonprofit based in the u.s uh that supports military veterans through sailing so when you think about navigating challenges whether it's coming back from a combat deployment or sustaining injury whether it's physical or mental ptsd um, or just getting off active duty and going into the civilian life this program helps a lot of uh active duty and veterans um, go through those transition, whether they're going through that transition at the time, or maybe they got off active duty 30 years ago and just want to be surrounded by similar experienced people um, that have served in the military. Um, and it's a, it's a great healthy team because not everyone there is struggling themselves. So you might have a couple of people that might be, have gone through some very challenging life situations, but then you have other veterans there that just want to support um, the other fellow team members. Um, so I think it's a really good mix of people on that team. Uh, and it's a, it, like I said, it's a nonprofit, but the team is based around the country with a couple different boats. 
Uh, and then we'll sometimes travel or we'll do local racing. Uh, so I've been sailing with the Naples team for the last, let's see, six years now. Uh, and in this, we, we have two boats here, a J109 and a Melgus 24. Uh, and if you want to go sailing two to three days a week, you could do that with this team. Uh, you sign up, it's free to join. We provide the safety equipment, the foul weather gear, and the training to teach you how to sail. And we do it primarily through racing, um, but it's not all racing. Sometimes we'll just go out there and do practice sails and teach people how to sail. Um, but we teach a lot of our the teammates racing on the race course. Yeah. So it makes it a fun, interesting, dynamic experience. I'm sure. Now, can any veteran basically do this? Absolutely. If you're if you're a veteran out there listening to this or you know a veteran, um, let them know about it. But yeah, all you gotta do is go to uspatriotsailing.org. You sign up, uh, give us a little bit of information about yourself, um, just so we can vet to make sure the, the right people are coming on board. Uh, no experience needed at all. And you can come say, and we got teams in Annapolis, in Solomons, Maryland, out in San Diego, in Seattle, Washington, um, and we're continuing to, to expand. And the biggest limiting factor is obviously money. Funding is always a challenge for a nonprofit, uh, but it's really the people. It's 100% volunteer run. So it's as much or as little as the volunteers can handle with getting the boats out of the water, out on the water, teaching the veterans how to sail, getting on the race course. Um, so it's all volunteer uh, run for this nonprofit. Yeah, what a great, great program. So I hope if we have any listeners out there that know veterans, um, whether they're, they're, they can volunteer to help with the program or whether they would uh, like to have some of the services and camaraderie and help that the program involves. This is really a great effort. So that's great. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so, Peter, let's now talk about the race. So I think last time we talked, it was several months away from the start of the race. And so talk about that sort of, you know, one month before the race starts. Sure. So it was pretty wild because leading up to the race, I was getting a new um, uh, wrap, like a new design logo for the boat. And I was getting some new sails made. And of course, that always takes longer than you plan. Um, and so it was, it was a, that part was, you know, a little closer to the race than what I liked. But there was a lot of preparation. I'd gotten new rudders for the boat, um, got those installed professionally by a, a local um, group that was where I was keeping my boat at. Uh, but going into the race, there's always a, like tons of little projects, and there's always the to-do list that you have to do, and then there's the to-do list that hey, what's the if I you know when I complete all those jobs or as I'm completing them, there's always the little things that you want to do to make little improvements, whether that's a performance improvement or hey, this is going to make the boat a little bit more efficient to sail or make it a little easier. Um, I did a lot of things like replacing lines on the boat, replacing halyards, sheets, so that if so, you have fresh lines, things like that, ready sure. to go. Sure. Um, and so there was a lot of preparation work that went into that, and then also just sailing the boat, and making sure that it's ready to go in terms of performance, but also safety-wise. Um, so tuning the rig, doing you know just sail testing a little bit of that, um, and then the final two weeks leading up to the start of the race. Uh, you actually have to get your boat to the starting line. So our starting line was at uh, Le Sable de Lone in France uh, on the West Coast, on the Bay of Biscay. And so you have to get there about two weeks early. So you're at the dock with all 90 boats there. And you're doing a combination of making sure that you're going to, you have to go to a bunch of uh, briefs where they give presentations on what do you need to know about the race. Um, but then there's always just projects going on, last minute things of, oh, I really need to switch this line out because I see a little bit of chafe there. Or I need to do... I want to do this and make a little bit of improvement um, because we have a little bit of time here right now. And so you're always doing some work on the boat, but then you're also just tracking the weather. What's the weather doing? A lot of it is just trying to figure out what do we what do we see the weather doing now? What do we think it's going to do in the future? How's it going to affect the race? Um, so you're you're balancing a lot of different things, and then on top of that, you're also trying to share the experience with a lot of the supporters, sponsors, followers, trying to get that information out there to show them real time. Hey, this is what's going on leading up to the race. So th there's a lot of things that take up your time. Um, but, and you're just focused on trying to do as much as you can before the start of the race. Yeah. So it sounds like to me that, uh, you're exhausted before you even start the race. And and that's a really big balance. Absolutely. There's some people that are doing, I mean, I was talking to some people where they're asking to borrow tools or little spare parts, things like that. Like the night before the start of the race being, Hey, this is not working now. I need to fix this. And there's some people that are definitely on the boat late at night, the night before the start. But then there's other people that are able to manage their time a little differently and are able to focus a little more on resting before the start. So yeah. definitely a balance. Uh, but 
yeah, there was a wide range of experiences for the fleet going into the start. Yeah, so you said 90 boats, I think. Yes. Uh, was this the biggest race you've ever been in? Meaning, uh, meaning the number, number of entrants, number of boats? Actually, no. So there was one other race. There was a 500-mile race the year prior that we had 100 minis starting oh, okay. on the line. Close, yeah. Uh, yeah, it was close. Um, but overall, 90 boats on the starting line is a lot more than the average mini race, though. Most races have anywhere from 50 to 70 entrants, maybe. Um, so this was definitely one of the larger starts. Yeah. You know, I've done a little bit of racing uh, and maybe 10 boats, you know, in the fleet, so to speak, at the starting line. And that was like nerve wracking to me. I mean, just 10 boats jockeying for position. It was crazy. I just can't imagine like 90 boats. It's a lot of boats out there on the starting line. And it's a it's a really long starting line, too. Uh, and then add into that, sometimes it's going to be an upwind start. Sometimes it's going to be a downwind mm. start or a reaching start. Um, and so there's rules that go into it. A lot of times for the starts, we can't have our bow sprit deployed for like the spinnaker. Um, but for some of the starts to include the mini transat, we were actually able to have our bow sprits deployed. So not only do you have 90 boats on the starting line, but each boat has a six <laughs> a foot bow sprit sticking out, a spear sticking out <laughs> in the front of the boat. And now you're you know fighting for your position on the starting line. And I got to say, those starts are very, very close. And even though you have thousands of miles to go, you're fighting for every inch on that starting line. Sure, sure. Wow. So what was, what was, how much sleep did you get the night before the race? Uh, let's see. I mean, I, I got enough to be rested, but it's hard to sleep the night before the race, any of these races, yeah. um, because you just have so much on your mind. You're, you're constantly checking the weather. And then I also like to wake up early too. I always add in an extra hour or two in the morning, just to just sit down and look at all the updated weather models. Because when you go to sleep, you might an hour or two later into your sleep the night before you're going to be getting get, get new weather forecasting coming down so i like to wake up early in the morning and just start looking at the weather um, and then also writing down the updated changes so that you have the freshest weather going out to the starting line uh, because we won't have that same access when we're out there that you have on your laptop or your phone uh before you leave for the start yeah so uh what uh Remind me, I think you said this race is in two legs. Yes. Yep. So the first leg is thirteen about 1,300 miles long, and that goes from Le Sable de Lone, France, out the Bay Biscay, around Cape Finisterre and northwest Spain, um, down past Portugal, and then you finish in the Canaries uh, in um, Santa Cruz de la Palma in the Canaries. So yeah. essentially west of Africa down there off Morocco. And, and so that's like, that's when you say a leg, that's what has a real start and a real finish. And then you have several days rest before the next leg starts. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, so it's, it's one start right there, one finish. And then we actually had about two and a half weeks between the two starts. Uh, so you have two and a half weeks to fix anything that happens. They also do that for a weather window, just because the fleet all doesn't arrive on the same day. There's going to be a couple sure. day gap between the first boat and the last boat. Uh, it also factors in a little bit if there's going to be a delay uh, in the start. And then so, but about two and a half weeks after we got there, we restarted. Everyone crosses the starting line at the same time again. Uh, and then the next leg is from the Canaries West to Guadalupe. And so yeah. that's about a 2,700 mile long leg. Yeah. Yeah. So <clears throat> talk to me a little bit about um, the safety equipment you have on board. We have a lot of safety equipment on board. Uh, but it's interesting. I'd say it's it's very similar to any 40 foot boat that you'd go offshore on. We have a lot of the same things. I have a big offshore life raft. It's actually a four man life raft on my boat because you have to have the right certifications for it. Uh, and then everything from uh, your life jackets, inflatable life jackets to tethers and jack lines that you're clipping into. So you're always clipped in when you're on deck to so every flares, spare food, spare water. Um, and so the, all that all that safety equipment is actually inspected. So bef a couple of days leading up before the start, all the boats get inspected by the race organization, and you have to pass that inspection before you leave the starting line. And it's a very thorough inspection. It can take a couple hours. Uh, and all the things they inspect it actually takes you do it over the course of a couple of days because there's so many different inspections that mm. they have to. And that includes uh, everything from essentially a ditch bag where you have a bunch of safety equipment that you could take with you on a life raft. Spare water, you have to have uh, nine liters of spare water 
and then they actually seal it so you can't empty it and refill that spare water. Um, and so, and there's a lot of seals, seals on your batteries so that you can't move batteries. Uh, and then seal on your life raft so they can tell if you moved your life raft or not, if that seal breaks. Uh, so they, they want to make sure that you're not, there's a couple of things, the batteries and the life raft are the biggest things that you can't move down below when you're racing. So they, they, they essentially do a little wire seal that if you move it at all, they can tell you break it. Uh, but if you need it for an emergency situation, it's easy to break that seal. Yeah. Um, so that's why, but yeah, so they go through everything from bow to stern on the boat, below deck, above deck, um, checking sales, make sure you have the correct number of sales because there's a limit on that. There's a lot of limits just for both safety and also for cost so that you're not spending more money on extra sales and things like that. Um, so there's a lot of, lot of checks that go into it. Um, but yeah, I would say if you like, you know, right now we're recording this as the new purple meter race is finishing. Yeah. Our, our safety standards are very similar to what you might go do that race in, in terms of what you're bringing on the boat. Um, things like e but then we also have to have our personal e and then we also have to have our personal AIS beacon. So whenever I'm sailing on the boat, I have that e for the boat, but then I also have my own e and AIS beacon on myself connected to my life jacket at all times. So if, if there, if anything goes wrong, there's ways to reach out for help that way through the beacon. Um, but what's a big difference is we're not allowed to have any satellite communication when we're out there. So we can't have a sat phone to call for emergency. We can't have, we don't have Starlink. So we're not sending emails out or calling people. We can't even have our phones on the boat. So we have to turn our phones into the uh, race organization before we even start. And they give you the, the your phone back at the end of the race. Um, part of that's for the satellite communications, but part of that is for also, we have to do everything on paper charts. So we have a GPS, but you can't have a chart plotter. So you can't have any sort of Navionics on your phone. I love Navionics on my phone, but we can't use that when we're out there racing. So you're doing everything on a paper chart. Uh, and then, uh, older version of a GPS that doesn't have any chart plotter. So you can't see depth on there. Um, but you have just very basic waypoints on a black and white screen. Yeah. Yeah. And do you do the route planning or do you have sort of like a team, a shore team that help you do that? Or because once you leave, you there's no more communication with anybody, correct? Ex exactly. So I, I did most of the route planning myself. Yeah, I had a friend helping me out a little bit going into it. Uh, and a lot of people will have maybe a friend help out, or they might be part of a training center where they have a coach that they've been paying for. And that coach d does a lot of the route planning for that training center. Um, so a lot of the the French teams, the French boats, they'll train in the training center with maybe five or 10 boats. And those five boats might have their own coach where that coach is talking them through a lot of the weather the night before the day of. Uh, but yeah, once you cross that starting line, it's on you. So whatever information you've taken through outside sources, once you're on the boat, it's all on you. And the only way we're getting weather updates is once a day, every afternoon on the single sideband radio receiver. So if you oh, think wow. about a little little weather radio that you might have, um, so we're not, it's not like a single sideband where we're transmitting, but we're able to receive, and it's a little battery powered radio receiver. And they do a forecast once a day, once in French and once in English, um, where they'll give you a little updates. But, uh, but that even that is hard because you have to write everything down. Um, a lot of us actually have a recorder. So I had a little recorder plugged into it so I could listen to it five times in a row if I needed sure. to. But they're giving you the grid point for the center of the low pressure, the center of the high pressure, estimated points of where that cold front might be going from and to. And so big picture things like that. And then they give you some wind information. So maybe the wind speed and direction and uh, the barometer pressure, but it'll be in really big grid zones that are a couple hundred miles wide. Right. So, and they get a little smaller when they get cl close, to, uh, close to the coast, but when you're offshore, the grids, you might have the weather for one point and the weather 200 miles to the west of that. And you're trying to interpolate based off what you yeah. experience, what you see and what you think is going to happen, what is actually happening out there. Yeah. But so you're not, you can't really download a grid file. Exactly. Yeah. So we can't download grid files. We don't have a laptop out there. You're not allowed to have that. Don't have any of that satellite communication to download those grids. Um, so it's really just whatever you can bring with you ahead yeah. of time. And then as that changes, but you know, when you're out there for 20 days, the weather's going to change a lot. So you have to rely on what you're getting from the race committee. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, talk about that first leg. Uh, how'd you do in the start, you know, and sort of briefly take us through that, that first leg. Sure. So the first leg left from France and leaving the Bay of is always a challenge, regardless of what the weather's conditions is. And once again, it was a challenge getting out of there. Um, and going into it, actually the start was delayed by about 24 hours 
because there was a big cold front coming through and a big low pressure system closer up to England. And they didn't want us going out of the Bay of Biscay when it was blowing steady 45 knots, gusting over 50 plus knots out there. So they delayed us by 24 hours. And then they found a small little weather window to get us out there. And they knew we'd be hitting us uh, some pretty bad weather, but it was within their tolerances. So they knew maybe on the fourth, third or fourth day out there, as we were leaving the Bay of Biscay, kind of going around Northwest Spain, we knew we'd get some weather out there. Um, but you, even though you can see what the projections are, you don't know exactly what it's going to be like. So it was definitely a pretty tense moment for a lot of the skippers. Uh, and part of that is they actually gave us a waypoint that we had to leave to starboard. So they, they gave us a waypoint pretty close to the Spanish coast, halfway out the bay. Um, so we had we all had to sail down pretty far south in the bay. And that was just to stay away from the worst of the weather closer to England. But going into that start, it was a reaching start. So everyone had their big code zero, which is a big furling um, sail, kind of a cross between a jib and a spinnaker. And it's uh, it's really good for reaching. Um, the problem with that start and the challenge for me was it was light air and it was almost upwind. It was just cracked off from upwind. So you're, you know, if you, if you furl the code zero and you're sailing with just a jib, you're not going fast enough. But then when I had my code zero up, I really struggled with pointing as well as some of the other boats did. And I think there's things I could have done looking back on it that may, might have would have helped, could have helped. But it was also challenging with a little bit of the design of my boat and how it's set up and my sails going because you have to pick your sails. You know, I designed these years in advance, so you're not actually able to change it. Just the, you know, the day of based off the right. weather conditions, right. you, you got what you got going into it. Um, but uh, so I struggled getting off the starting line in that really really close reach light air where you're almost sailing upwind with code zero. Um, but then once the wind shifted a little bit, a couple hours later, I was able to do a, a little bit better and I was able to start passing some boats, catching up to the fleet. Um, but yeah, that first 24 hours was pretty demoralizing. Just trying to get off the starting line. I just wasn't happy with it myself, frustrated. Mm. Yeah. I'd spent three years going into this for a start that I was not happy with, with myself. Um, and so it, I was really hard on myself mentally, but only pushed myself harder to keep catching up. Um, and so as the wind clocked around a little bit, we were able to switch over to the spinnaker. And that first night, spinnaker up, just flying downwind, you know, gust in the high 20s with the spinnaker up, and you're just cruising. And it's pretty cool because all the boats are pretty close together still. So you can see, you know, dozens of masthead. All you see is a little masthead light on each of these boats all around you as you're trying not to wipe out and you're surfing down wave waves, you know, probably going 12, 13 knots with the spinnaker up um, and just pushing the boat hard that first night. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then as we got out of the bay, um, we definitely hit that weather system that we were expecting and it was pretty rough out there. So that was as we were turning left around the Northwest, uh, part of Spain. And it was bad enough that one of the boats only about five miles away from me ended up dismasting. Oh, wow. So his whole mass broke. Um, but luckily he was close enough that he was able to get close enough to shore and then get a tow in. Um, so he was fine. Um, but the boat was out of the race for that one. But there, it was really challenging for a lot of the boats. And I had gone a little bit farther offshore than I probably should have, um, trying to get a certain wind angle. Um, and so that part wasn't great tactically looking back on it, but I wasn't out of it by any means because there were so many passing opportunities throughout that race. Um, because once all that blew through, it got really light for the next couple of days. And uh, you know, I was with a pack of boats and even though you don't have outside communications with satellite communication, if you're close to a boat, you have the VHF radio. Yes. So I'm able to talk to some of my competitors out there that I know, and we're talking on the radio and you're just trying to get through these light patches, just being like, what is going on? Like, how are we? And, and you don't know where the other boats are because we can't see the tracker. So everyone at home is watching the tracker. We can only see what's within about 10 miles of us on our AIS display that we have on the boat. Um, and so you really don't know exactly what's going on. Where did some people go inshore? Did some people go offshore? And so there were just so many tactical opportunities that you're trying to navigate through um, throughout that leg. And even though that's the shorter leg, I mean, it was still about a uh, 11 day long race. So 11 days out there, just trying to push the boat as hard as you can. But once we got through that light air off Cape Finisterre, the wind started picking up. And flying downwind off the coach of Portugal, it was an unbelievable part of the race. Just one of those moments you won't ever forget, just because you have the spinnaker up for multiple days. You might only do one jibe in a day. And yeah. you just just keep the boat going, just pushing as hard as you can, get, just trying to maximize your speed and the, the direction you're trying to sail to. 
Um, so that was a big part of that that first half of the leg. Yeah, yeah. So eleven days was this the longest uh, duration sale that you have done solo sale? To this Let's point? see. Yeah, I, I would say that was probably the longest. I don't know about time wise, but definitely the length wise because it was okay. a little bit longer than the France the Azores, but only by about maybe a hundred miles. So I was confident in the boat and myself. I had done a distance that long before, um, so I was I wasn't. I wasn't as concerned about the distance, but it was just the aspect of going through Bay Biscay, Cape Finisterre. It's a very technical area with wind yes. shifts and bad weather coming in. Um, and the problem is if you break something on the boat there, that could end the race because you have to get to the finish line within a certain time window. Um, and if, and it's based off the first three boats that finished within that class. And so if you don't get there within a certain time period, you're disqualified from the rest of the race. So you can't restart in that second leg. Yeah. So it's a balance yeah. between pushing the boat as hard as you can, but also not pushing it to have a catastrophic breakage where now you're not going to be able to complete the rest of the race. Yeah. So you finished in the Azores, the first leg. Uh, Canaries for the Canaries. Time. I'm sorry, yeah. the Canaries. Yeah. Yes, the Canaries. So what, what what was that feeling like? You know, <laughs> see, seeing the land. <laughs> yeah, well, let, let's back up a few hours before the finish line. So everything yeah. was great, flying downwind for multiple days. And then there was this high pressure bubble just sitting over the Canaries. Uh. And the entire fleet just slowed down as, as we approached it. And I thought going into that morning, the last morning, I was going 11, 12 knots, surfing downwind, just flying. And then I hit that bubble of no wind. And I thought I was going to be getting in there by like lunchtime based off the forecast. <laughs> I didn't end up finishing until the next morning at about 2 a.m. <laughs> so it was a really painful last 12 hours. Oh, gosh. It's going to be awful. You're so you're so close. Right? I know. Like, ah, I can you can smell land. <laughs> oh, absolutely. You can see that you can see everything. And you're basically drifting at a, at the speed of the current. And then we also had a nice um, a little bit of waves kind of pushing us, too. So now it's basically just pushing my boat perpendicular to the waves, just so it would push me um, going towards it and or just following the seas yes. and having it just hit my stern, just trying to push me towards the finish line. But then as I got about a mile or two out, my next concern was one, it's night, so I can't see anything. And if the current pushes me past the finish line, there's no way I can turn back up right. and try to actually <laughs> get it. So now you're trying to adjust your course and your heading based off what the current's doing, because there's just no wind there. Oh, and just man. trying to get these little these little bit of puffs in this yeah it was it was a real challenge so it was a fight to the end um and everyone was struggling on there i remember seeing the boats that were you know 30 maybe 30 miles ahead of me all of a sudden they were five miles ahead of me and i'm looking at my ais screen saying there's no way they're only five miles ahead of me like something is wrong but everyone just hit this bubble and just stopped as we were trying yeah. to get to the finish line yeah it's like a traffic jam almost right the front front three boats stop and everyone piles up behind them exactly exactly because they still have wind wow so uh so but then talk about what what the finish was like for this leg yeah so crossing the finish line i crossed at night or about two in the morning and the finish line it was um right off the finish uh right off the beach there so you're within just maybe 100 yards of the beach um and it was just dead quiet but you can it, it's hard to see because there's a little blinking light on the actual um inflatable mark that's the finish line but it's the background behind that is this whole sure. city yeah, that's yeah, lit yeah. up with a <laughs> bunch of lights behind it so even trying to find that was hard but yeah. uh santa cruz de la palma is a really fascinating little town on the water but it's on a hill so the whole the whole city kind of raises up on this steep hill um and it, it was just it was definitely an emotional experience because even though I didn't place as well as I'd hoped, you know, as I wanted to performance wise, just getting to that part of the finish line meant that I was within the time limit. I didn't have any major breakages and I knew I was going to be able to restart for the second leg Perfect. and just be able to achieve that. Because as I mentioned earlier, one boat broke the mass. Another boat actually had to get abandoned because their keel was falling off. And so he'd get that guy had to get picked up by a, a cargo ship. Um, so hearing those stories about those people having major breakages, I was yeah. just thankful that I didn't have any major problems on my own boat and I was able to get there. Excellent. Excellent. So then uh, how much downtime did you have? Well, I shouldn't say downtime, but how much time did you have between the start of the next race, the next Yeah, leg? so it was a little over two weeks and it was great because I was able to do a little bit of maintenance on the boat, clean it up, get it nice and clean, um, do fix a little, small things here and there. 
but I didn't have any major breakages, which was really nice. Um, so I was able to go explore the island. Um, and one of the other great things was my girlfriend came to the finish line and then she flew back home for work and then came back for the start. So she was there for a couple of days on the front end and the back end. So we were able to go explore the island together and go visit La Palma and yeah, incredible island to go see. Um, and just the, the black volcanic beaches that they have there. Um, I'd never been on a black sandy beach before. Uh, and so that was, that was a pretty cool experience to, to be there for. Yeah. So talk about the second leg, the start. Yeah. So the second leg, so going into that start, um, it is all the boats restart at the same time together. And it was a challenge because it's, it's pretty close to the land, but it's so deep there that they couldn't actually anchor the race committee boat. Um, so that, that's one challenge in itself. So the race committee boat is trying to stay in this, this one spot. And then it was really light air, um, almost drifting conditions. Uh, so my whole goal going to that start, which is stay as close to the starting line as possible. Um, I, did, I did a pretty good job on that. So I had a pretty decent start, but it was just such light air. Um, again, code zero at the start. Some boats went from the code zero to the spinnaker going back and forth. Uh, but I, I, I think I had a pretty decent start. I was in the top third of the fleet there. And that was one of those things. Sometimes you get a puff and it'll push you forward. Sometimes you get in a lull and you see some of the boats sail by. Um, but overall I was pretty happy with that. And a lot of the fleet stayed really close together that first 24 hours. Um, because we had to round the farthest Southwest Island, um, was a hero Island, something like that. Uh, we didn't leave that island to starboard. And then once you left that island to starboard, you could basically go wherever you wanted out in the ocean um, for a while. Um, and so, so yeah, so for the first day and a half, a lot of the boats were together. But then the real question was, okay, day two, where do you go? Do you stay on rum line, uh, short distance to the finish line? Do you take the northern route? Do you take the southern route? Um, and talking to a lot of my fellow competitors that morning, there was a lot of mixed feelings, and a lot of unknowns. Yeah, because the routing was all over the place. It was showing some of the routings was showing maybe a one day advantage going the northern route, but then there was going to be a lot of issues or challenges with weather systems, with trying to get the right weather systems as they were changing. Whereas the southern route was showing uh, stronger trade winds, trade wind, but you're sailing a longer distance. Um, and then the the middle of the route, more of the run line, was showing pretty light light wind spots. Um, so my whole thought process was, okay, I could go the northern route, but it's going to be harder to time the wind shifts and the weather systems correctly because we know we're not looking at grip files. Or I can take the slightly longer route, but have more consistent higher wind speeds. Right. Um, so I ended up going the southern route. And there was a mix of boats. As we were going out there, you see some boats, um, and as we rounded that last island, some of the boats were close hauled going upwind trying to go that northern route. Whereas I put my code zero up, cracked off, and was on a beam reach. Uh, just flying flying downwind more towards the southern part of it. Uh, and at that point, we didn't know really what was going to happen with the fleet. Really big spread of the boats as they started going out there. Uh, but I, I was really happy with the southern route. And I think on going into that the evening of the fifth day, I was by one of the brand new prototype boats, you know, as they were coming uh -huh. across. So it was pretty cool being around some of the boats that were should be much faster than me. And so I, I was pretty happy with my performance. Now, if you're following along looking at the tracker, all the boats that were went the southern route, they were showing that they were the last place on the tracker or like the bottom end of the tracker because we hadn't started going west yet. So the boats that had gone west right away, they were all sure. showing like really good on the tracker because they were knocking out miles going west first. Right. And so it was one of those things, those balances of, okay, you're not going west yet, but you're going south towards those stronger trade winds um, that you're trying to get into. So it was challenging for a lot of the fleet that went south initially. But then as the days went on, you could see, okay, this is actually starting to work. This is this is going to start looking good uh, for the Southern boats. Yeah. So remind me what time of year this was. Uh, so the first leg started end of September. Second leg started end of October. So you're just sort of on the tail end of hurricane season for that second leg. Definitely. Um, but, and, and yes, you are. And, but that's also why they have the ability to, if they needed to delay the start, sure. they could, if they had like a big system coming across. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you're, you're just, uh, you're, you're just kind of on the tail end or beyond that. Um, and there's a lot of cruising boats going across at that time too. There were some other rallies going across. So it's a pretty good time, um, to go. And they've been doing this race every other year since 1977. Yes. So they kind of have the planning down on, okay, when do we want to start this race? Uh, cause you don't want to start too early and don't want to start too late. And so there's a lot that goes into that. Yeah. 
Yeah. So uh, talk about getting close to, you know, to the finish, uh, smelling land again. Well, yeah. actually, do you mind if I take us back a little bit on that? Because, no, go. Yeah. So, Please. so the first five days were great. And going into day six, I was flying downwind. It was, it was an awesome experience in terms of I had a reef in the spinnaker, which I know most boats don't have a reef in the spinnaker, but we actually, ours reefs up from the bottom. So you can have a little bit of smaller spinnaker, uh, reef in the jib, two reefs in the main. And I was hitting up to 16 knots of boat speed, wow. surfing down waves, just flying, um, doing a lot, a lot of hand steer. You know, we have an autopilot, but in those conditions, you really got to hand steer through these big waves, through the wind. I mean, blowing 25 knots in the trade winds and just very consistent wind. It was, it, it was, it was just what the boat is designed for and everything was going great until about one o'clock in the afternoon on day six when I'm hand steering. And then all of a sudden I wipe out a little bit and I look back and my rudder is completely ripped off the back of the boat. No. Oh my so gosh. These boats have two rudders and the rudder that was the lured rudder that was in the water completely ripped off and was dragging behind the boat as I'm surfing down these waves. Oh, did you hit hit something or just the force of everything? So I, at the time, I didn't know what exactly happened, but I was able to recover it because I have a tiller bar connected from the rudder to the tiller. So I was able to hold it. So I was able to drop the sails, bring the rudder on board. And I had about two big chunks taking out of the leading edge of the rudder. Mm. Um, so I definitely hit something, but I, I think I hit something earlier, a couple hours earlier when I wasn't steering, when I didn't really feel it um, because when I was when it broke off, I didn't really feel anything. So I think it was just yeah. the, it eventually just wore it down to, and it stressed it too much after those uh, hitting something out there in the water. And there, unfortunately there's so much you can hit out there too. So, you know, you can be looking as much as you want, but there's stuff under the water that yeah. you're eventually you going to hit. And there was a couple right. other boats that had rudder damage as well too. Um, so it's not uncommon. It's probably a little more, it's more common than we like out there. But at that point, when it worked off, it went from, okay, we're racing, we're pushing as hard as we can to, okay, are we in a survival situation or are we just trying to like fix this? Or And so I was kind of, I wasn't in a full on survival situation because I went down below to check. I had no water coming in because that was my other concern. You know, when this rudder rips yeah. off, now do yeah. I have water coming in? Am I sinking? So basically I, I stopped the, I dropped the sail, stopped the boat, went down below, didn't have any water coming in. And I was really lucky because on the rudder, the pintle and gudgeons that um, hold it onto the, the hull, they were still all intact on the rudder. And the only thing that broke were eight stainless steel bolts that hold the gudgeons onto the hull. Oh, so it. those all sheared off, those eight bolts. Huh. And the other end of those bolts with the nut and the um, Cicaflex, they all stayed within those holes. So I didn't have any water coming in those holes at all, which was very fortunate. Um, but now I'm down to one rudder. And for maybe like a split second, I'm thinking, okay, can I do the next 2,100 miles <laughs> on this one rudder? Yeah. Um, and the short answer is, okay, well, one, if I break the other one, now it's a full on survival situation with no rudders on the boat. Um, but then also two, it was the starboard rudder that was still on, but I really needed the port rudder to go across west. Uh, so essentially what I did was I put the sails back up, jived over, looked at my new course. So it was like, okay, where am I heading to now? And Really, the only option that came out was uh, Cape Verde uh, with those islands down there, um, which um, if, for, for those who haven't been to Cape Verde, it's off the west coast of Africa. And the other thing I'm thinking about, too, is there's there's not many options to pull into that I'm aware of because I've never sailed in this area before. And I don't really want to pull into an unknown port in West Africa with a giant American flag on the side of my boat. Right, right. Um, <laughs> not 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 an ideal situation there. Because as you're looking in, like, because I had some uh, books on board for some of those uh, ports, and they're you know putting things out there like piracy concerns and, yes. and theft and things like that. So the last thing I want to do is go to an area that has some known piracy in the area. So, uh, but Cape Verde, I'd known there's cruisers going in there before. Um, so start going down that way. And at that point, I also I don't have a sat phone, so I can't just call up um, anyone left to know what's going on. But we do have a, a GPS tracker on the boat for the race. Yeah, so they see and, it. So they, they see me going the wrong way. And I basically send the, we have a couple of pretext things, whether you're sinking, injured, you break your mass. And one of the preset things is um, presence on board. So at least I let them know, hey, I'm going slow right now. I'm going the wrong direction, but I'm still on board. So something's wrong, but I'm still on board. So I can, I can communicate. And, uh, and normally you're not allowed to really like message through that thing at all. Cause there's a little bit of a text feature, but on that GPS track, it's a yellow brick tracker. 
um, they asked me to just tell them like, what is going on? And so all I can really text is um, rudder broke off Cape Verde repair. And that one text transmission probably took like 10 minutes to type out <laughs> because you're scrolling through every single letter and every single character on, on the, on the little tracker. And it's attached to the pulpit on the back of the boat. So you're kind of outside with the boat rocking and rolling, trying to type this thing. And oh those few gosh. little words definitely took about 10 minutes. And I didn't want to put too much out there because I also didn't want to get disqualified for communicating with the race committee. Um, but I know they, they'd asked me just like, tell us just like a little bit of like what, what's going on. Um, so yes, yeah, so I told them the rudder broke off and I'm going to Cape Verde. That's all they knew. And I was about almost 300 miles away from Cape Verde. So that's a pretty serious sail down there with one rudder yeah. trying to yeah. figure out what's next. Um, so they put out a press release letting people know like, hey, his rudder broke off. He's going to Cape Verde. That's all we know at this time. Uh, and so uh, my girlfriend at the time who was in Annapolis, and that's where we live, um, she was back home in Annapolis. And she started going through the basically immediate actions, crisis response of, okay, okay what could have gone wrong? What could have happened? And start talking to people to figure out like, how can we get this thing fixed? Um, she doesn't know exactly what port I'm pulling into, what island I'm pulling into, none of that stuff. Um, but she ends up through a contact of um, online contacts. Um, one of them is through like a Facebook group of women who sail. Another one was through the Magenta Project, a nonprofit that she's part of that supports women in sailing. So like through these different connections, she finds people that know of Cape Verde, maybe know someone there. And before you know it, she had a um, like a boat repair shop open on a Saturday ready for me to come in there oh wow um but i didn't know any of that because they couldn't tell me any of that right, so i had right. no i had no idea what to expect so and then as i'm getting close to this one island which by the way the book i have is telling me like okay they have a 60 ton crane they have a dry dock all this stuff for big ships you know what you might need to have for a big ship but they don't actually tell you okay what has a little boat store that you can get, go buy some six millimeter bolts like they don't have that kind of information so i have no idea what i'm getting myself into and as i get closer i try to call the marina on the radio and they don't even respond. So I'm just like, what? Like, all right, we're just going to try. So I'm full, going there, full expecting to go in there, tell them, oh, no, you got to go two islands over to this other place. Yeah. And so as I'm sailing in there, wiping out, because I only have one rudder, trying to, and then short tack upwind through a channel and then drop anchor because I can't even get to the dock because I don't have, we don't have motors on our boat, so we can't just motor in. Um, so I drop anchor. And then one of the other cruising boats comes by on a dinghy. And this guy says, hey, like, you're an American because obviously it's American flag on the boat. It says, hey, I'm from North Carolina. How you doing? Can I give you a ride into shore? <laughs> so now I got this other fellow American giving me a ride into, uh, into shore. And then as I get in there, like, oh, we've been expecting you. But they had a bunch of French cruising boats coming at the same time. So they're busy helping all these bigger boats tie up and everything. Um, but long story short, they get me into the dock. They tow, help me tow my boat in. And they do the repair in about four hours. So they essentially pull out the old bolts, put the new bolts in. Um, I had done a little bit of fiberglass repair on the rudder as we were getting closer there. Um, to the island. So, um, but because of the rules, I couldn't just leave once I was done with those four hours. I had to stay there for 12 hours because it's a technical stopover. So you have to stay for at least 12 hours, but you can't stay for more than 72 hours. I see. But I got in at about 10 o'clock in the morning. And by 10 o'clock in the evening, I was, I was heading back out to the race course. Wow. And I had a, another cruiser who had his little dinghy tow me, tow me out of the dock. Uh, but yeah, so it was quick. Hey, I got, Got a lunch order, you know, two entrees. And look at me like, oh, why are you eating so much food? <laughs> so I ate a bunch of food. I got two showers on there, um, <laughs> dove the boat, make sure there's no problems underneath the boat, cleaned it all out, you know, replaced one of the halyards that had some chafe and was right back out there. Yeah. Wow. Holy smokes. I didn't, I didn't know any of that, man. I just thought, you know, it was the milk run, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice, easy cruise. Yeah. So, oh, so smooth. it was a challenge. So at that point, and I, I also was able to borrow someone's cell phone. So I don't even have a cell phone on them there. So I had to borrow someone's cell phone to talk to the race committee. Um, and once I called them, um, they were also like, Hey, you know, you're clear to leave, but just so you know, you're out there all by yourself for the rest of this race, because I'm so far away from the rest yeah. of yeah. the boats. And for the mini transat, there are about six support boats that follow along with the fleet. But they even told me, like, yes, there's support boats out there, but no one's near, no one's going to be close to you. The closest one's maybe five or 600 miles away. And if you have any problems, they're not going to turn around and go get you. So you're on your own when you leave uh, Cape Verde. And I'm so far south, I'm almost on the same latitude as Guadalupe. So not only did I have to go three miles south out of the way, now I'm heading west across the Atlantic Ocean, sailing more distance because I'm so much farther south than everyone else. Right. right. But the one good thing is I had more wind than everyone else, too. 
So I had for the next nine days going across, I had about a steady 25 knots of wind. Um, so with the spinnaker up and just trying to push as hard as I could to catch back up to the fleet. So it was a real challenge. And and it was tough because mentally I was really hard on myself because I just felt like a big failure at that point because I was just so far behind. And, you know, the last thing I wanted to do was, you know, be the dead last boat coming in and all that kind of stuff. And and it took me a couple of days to kind of talk myself out of that bottom because I know what to talk to. So I can't I can't talk right. to someone and be like, oh, you're doing fine, or like, hey, just complete the race. It's all on you. So it took a couple of days to kind of really talk myself out of that low point of the race. And but while I'm still doing it, I'm still trying to push the boat as hard as I can. And you know, you're every once in a while you're wiping out because you just got too much sail area up and the a wave comes in from a slightly different direction and you're you crash drive the boat right. and you're healed over. And of course that happens a lot at nighttime, maybe when you're sleeping and you have autopilot on. So um, so it was not an easy sail across, but I just kept on pushing the thing and ended up catching back up to the fleet. Holy wow, that's remarkable. Yeah. So I was able to pass one of the serious boats and one of the prototype boats. And just beyond, you know, so I only finished, you know, maybe a day behind a lot of the uh, a lot of the, the, the boats out there. But uh, I was definitely not the last boat by any means coming across. <laughs> well, that's great, Peter. Wow, what a great recovery. You know, these these endurance events, whether it's an endurance sail like this or whether you run a marathon or, you know, there's lots of examples of that. So much of, of, of them is mental. I mean, clearly you you experienced that and you kind of talked about that a little bit is right. Just feeling down because things are not going well and there's still a long way to go. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I still had about 2000 miles to sail once I left Cape Verde. Yeah. yeah. So talk to me a little bit about sort of what was your biggest oh, other than what we just talked about yeah. hitting something other than that what was your biggest sort of unexpected challenge something that you 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 totally didn't sort of expect um i don't know about i i think i expected it but i think it was still the biggest challenge it was just yeah that many days at sea um spending almost 20 or spending at 20 almost 21 days or yeah, it was about 20 spending 20 days at sea that was the longest i've been out in the ocean and just knowing that you know yes it's a race and you're pushing yourself but also at a certain point it's also survival out there so make sure you have enough food and water because we don't have a water maker out there so you're bringing all your water right. so oh, wow. you know what happens if your water goes bad what happens if your water containers break uh what happens if you didn't bring enough food so you, not only are you trying to manage the boat but you're also trying to manage yourself uh sleep was really hard because you're not sleeping much the longest single nap I got going across the Atlantic was 40 minutes and my body would not let me sleep more than 40 minutes or when I wanted to, the boat might've wiped out or something happened or I was sleeping great. And then I hear something, you know, something feels wrong in the boat or you hear something right. and you wake up. Um, and so I'm taking a series of naps, but yeah, the longest one was 40 minutes, but most of them were anywhere from 25, 30 minutes long when you're that far out. And then when you're close to shore, they're closer to like 10 minutes, 12 minute naps. Um, so they're not, so the sleep, there's definitely a managing the sleep deprivation, but that was the longest I'd been out offshore and the farthest away from any outside help too. Cause if anything gone wrong, if I was in a survival situation, you might be a week from help or more right. potentially. Right. Easily. Right. Yeah. Easily. Cause that's not a big shipping route down there. I don't think. No. So yeah. So when I left Cape Verde, I didn't see. I guess after that day, I didn't see a single ship or sailboat that entire way across until yeah. I got close to Guadalupe. Yeah. Um, so I was really out there just by myself. Yeah. Wow. So if, if you were, what, what were like the, like the top three lessons learned? Um, top three lessons learned. Uh, that's tough. Cause I mean, you learn so much every time you go out there. Uh, I think you always learn something about preparation. You know, once you cross the starting line, there's certain things where you're like, oh, I wish I'd focused more on this or done more on this. Um, I think preparation and training, I wish I wish I'd done more training on the boat. And what I mean by that is going to the starting line, I'd already had 8,000 miles of offshore experience on this boat alone. So that's yeah. the equivalent of going across the line twice. So I would felt comfortable on the boat and I knew it very, very well after those all, all those miles but I wish I'd done more training against other boats in more of like a practice situation. Um, but unfortunately part of that was a function of time. I just couldn't spend all my time in France. It costs a lot of money over there. 
and I didn't have a visa. So I couldn't spend more than three months over there out of the year. Uh, and so that was kind of a lot of, and it was also my first season was the first year that they started opening up from COVID. So there's a lot of COVID restrictions going in into it too. All right. Um, so even when right. I applied for a visa, they kept denying it. Uh, so there was, that was the biggest lesson that I kind of knew going into it, but I wish I'd done a lot more training. Mm -hmm. Um, another lesson learned I would have done is, I mean, there's, there's a lot of different things, but I think the training is the bigger, biggest one. Um, what about, what about sort of physical prep or boat prep? Anything yes. in that category? So boat prep, I mean, I think I did the most I could have done on the boat. Um, I mean, it's, it's a shame. Those rudders that broke, that one rudder that broke, both those were brand new rudders I just bought that year. And which wasn't an easy process because I had to get those built in Argentina by the boat builder, get them shipped over. And then I had them installed professionally by a shop that does a lot of class 40s and is one of the top shops around there in France. So, um, but it, I'd replaced all the lines. I'd gotten all new lines uh, from New England ropes and through fossil boat supplies. Like, so I had, I had a lot of gear on the boat that was all fresh. Um, you know, my mass and standing rigging, I'd gotten that brand new the first season over. So they're only three years old. So in terms of that boat prep, I'd done a lot. Um, but I think there's always more you can do. There's always more fine tuning on the electronics. That was probably another one too. The electronics were good, but fine tuning your autopilot controls yeah. and things like that. Um, and then I think the other thing too is I, I wish I'd done more, like, I guess, study and practice on the navigation side of things, which is hard because I'd already done a lot. I going, I mean, at the time I knew there was always more you can do, but you know, if I'd done the, if I do the race again, you know, next time I have that knowledge base to build off of, of, Hey, what do I need to look at differently? Or what do I need to look at more? Um, whether it's focusing on the wind or focusing on the currents or different things like that. And how do you prep it? Because you can't have your laptop out there. So having different ways to prep your, your road book, when you go out there of a bunch of things printed out. Um, I think I learned a lot on the weather side of things and the weather routing. Uh, it just through the experience of it. Yeah. Yeah. What about, what about on the physical or mental side? Uh, I think I was pretty good on that. Um, on the phys So, cause I, I think I, I overcame some big challenges mentally, whether it was the first starting line in France and not doing very well off the starting line or having do going through that rudder breakage. I think mentally yeah. I came back from that pretty well, you know, with that, I think I'll be even better next time. Just having that, that practice. Um, but I feel like mentally and physically, uh, I think I was pretty good going to this. I was probably in one of the best shapes of my life going into the start just because I'd worked out a lot. Um, you know, part of that summer, I'd, I was back in Annapolis uh, just because I couldn't spend the whole summer over in France. So spent the summer in, in Annapolis working over here and working out a lot physically. So physically, I felt really strong going into it. Um, and but it's interesting, you, you know, whenever I go out there, I always lose weight going out there just because you're just working your body so hard and you're not lifting weights when you're out there, but it is very physically demanding. So I probably lost about 15 pounds on this race. So I was happy that I had done some weightlifting going into it, trying to build a little bit of muscle because I knew I was going to be uh, using some of that up when I was out there. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we've been chatting for almost an hour. So I want to start wrapping this up, Peter. It's been great. So what's uh, what's your next adventure? So next adventure, I mean, I would definitely want to do more offshore sailing. Um, actually, in about two weeks, I'm heading over to Ireland uh, with U.S. Patriot Sailing, and we're chartering two boats, and we're racing in a race within Cork Race Week, um, but it's called the Beaufort Cup, where we race against other uh, veteran and first responder sailing teams um, for a trophy. Uh, and so that's going to be the next immediate adventure. Is And for part of that, it's an offshore race where we sail around Fastnet Rock, but then it's also buoy racing. Um, but longer term, I definitely want to do more offshore racing. I would love to do this race again. Uh, I really want to do it in a prototype, um, and definitely a, a newer boat. Yeah. Uh, and if, and when I do this race again, I want to be in a position where I could win the race. That's my next goal is to be in a position with a boat, with the right training where I could go win the mini transat. Um, because an American has not won this race in a long time. I think only one has, and I think it was back in the my late seventies, early, early eighties. So it's been, it's been a while since American has won this race. I would love to do that. Um, so that's my next goal. And then beyond the sailing, I'm actually still in the Marine Corps reserve. So I'm going to a, uh, next month also, I'm starting a one-year school for the Marine Corps, um, oh. in, in Quantico, Virginia. So 
I'll still be sailing a lot on the weekends, but that's just a way to do my military time that I, I need to do. But then also use that year while I'm in school to figure out what the next adventure might be. Yeah. Um, yeah, but the mini transat, I'm definitely looking at since it's every other year, I'm looking at the uh, 2027 mini transat. Oh, that's great. Yeah. That's and then great. even beyond that, the, the, my ultimate goal is race solo nonstop around the world in the Vendee globe. That's, that's oh. the ultimate goal. Wow. That's uh that, that'd be fantastic. Well, Peter, thank you so much for being on the podcast again. This was a great sort of culmination of, of our, your first episode that we recorded when it was all about prep, getting ready for this. And now hearing your story of, of uh, finishing the race and, and the challenges you had, that was really great. Um, if I remember correctly, people, people, if they want to get a hold of you, it would be at P as in Peter, G as in Gibbons, N as in Neff, Ocean Racing. Is that correct? That's correct. Yep. Uh, PGNOceanRacing.com. Uh, they can definitely find me on there. My email address, my phone number's on there. Feel free to send me an email, reach out. And then I actually started my own little podcast where I'm interviewing some of the other skippers from the race. Oh, great. Um, called the Mini Transit Mission. So if you check that out, you'll hear some other stories as well. Super. Um, yeah. Super. And remember, listeners, uh, support U.S. Patriot Sailing. Uh, it's a great organization and uh, really helping our veterans. Um, and, uh, if you want to go sailing and, and you're a veteran, this is the place to do it. Absolutely. Hey, Bella, thank you so much. It's been a, it's been great talking to you again. Uh, really enjoy your show here. Yeah. Thank you very much for being on the show again, Peter. Take care. Wow. Bela, that was some story. Absolutely unbelievable. What were your main takeaways? Question one and question two, are you ready to do something like this? Well, let me do the easy, easy one first. Question two: No, <laughs> I'm not ready. <laughs> I don't. I don't even have a desire to sail across the Atlantic. I, I'm, I'm, I'm very comfortable, kind of coastal cruising, as they call it, going on a you know four or five day cruise someplace. That's what works for me, um, and uh, I enjoy that immensely. Uh, so here's my takeaways for something like this. Uh, you know the the mental prep sort of and the stress that's associated with this you are on your own and i'll tell you even for me there's a huge difference uh when i take my boat out by myself and even if it's just for a four-hour sail but just sort of taking that boat out by myself versus if i have one or two or three other people on the boat with me and it's remarkable how much additional preparation and thinking through everything you you're going to do or you may need to do and being prepared for that um that i go through when when i go out by myself right i mean simple things like at least sailing around narragansett bay i i, I can't go down below for five minutes because there's too many boats and too much traffic around i sort of have to be on the lookout all the time so you know, I, I get my snacks ready in advance and I bring them up to the <laughs> cockpit, right? I have drinks there, right? So little things like that, because, you know, quite honestly, the first time I did it, I didn't do that. <laughs> I said, oh man, I'm getting hungry. <laughs> well, I can't go down below to make a sandwich. <laughs> it doesn't work because I can't leave the helm. Now, if you're out in the middle of the ocean, it's a little bit different, but that's just one example of sort of the level of detail uh, that you have to think through when you're doing stuff by yourself. Uh, so I think to me, that was the biggest takeaway that, that I really hadn't thought about in such a way of saying, oh gosh, I'm going to sail thousands of miles for, for weeks on end by myself. How am I going to do all these things? And, and I really have to totally depend on myself. And, and for me, there are parts of that that are wonderful. But the parts that are wonderful are just, for me, are just as wonderful if there's someone else there with you. <laughs> In other words, the level of sort of pleasure that I get from sailing doesn't increase if I'm by myself. Uh, the amount of anxiety increases, <laughs> but, but the amount of pleasure doesn't. Maybe the satisfaction of accomplishing it uh, is a little bit more, uh, but... Uh, I, 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 that was for me, the big takeaway was wow. Yeah. And being ready for the unexpected. 
Yeah. An incredible amount of mental and physical strength to me that I'm, you know, very honest with myself that I have neither, <laughs> you know, but, um, right. but really amazing to hear about. Um, you know, there really wasn't anything mini about this, you know, there's mini in the name of this thing, but it wasn't. I was really interested in the qualifying process to go through this, that you couldn't just say, I'm going to do it, right? There was all these steps involved. Is this typical in long distance sailing? Uh, it is. Um, in most organized long distance sales, um, there's typically some sort of qualifying that you have to go through. Uh, and then uh, before the sale, um, there is uh, usually a very detailed, and Peter talked about this, sort of inspection of your boat to make sure that it's up to snuff. And so I did a little bit of a little bit of uh, uh, snooping around. So I looked up the first solo around the world race, which was the goal. It was called the Golden Globe, and it was the first Golden Globe. And it started in 1968. Uh, and and there was nine sailors, nine boats that started that race in 1968. And and. One of the entrants had zero sailing experience. Wow. <laughs> so, I mean, zero <laughs> sailing experience. Um, of those nine sailors, um, four of them, so it started in England. So four of them retired before they left the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> right? So they didn't, they didn't even make it. They didn't even make it down to uh, Africa, the southern tip of Africa. Um, there was there was one individual, which was a, a a book and a movie written about it. And and you should you should if you didn't haven't read this book or seen the movie, you should. A guy named Donald Cowhurst, <laughs> who who also had very little sailing experience, kind of entered at the last minute, and. Uh, he tried to uh, fake the around the world uh, trip. So you can imagine in 1968, communicate, there's no satellites, right? The communication stuff that doesn't work as well. And so there, there were, uh, they, have, they, do, they did have single sideband shortwave radios. And they, like once a week, they're supposed to check in with their position and stuff. And this guy, Donald Cowhurst never left the Atlantic Ocean, but he kept checking in and saying, oh, yeah, I'm here. And he's going around the world because <laughs> it was a radio. There was no there was no no way to to, to look on us. I mean, now I, ha I can have a little device for like two hundred dollars that will connect to a satellite and transmit my location to a website that anybody can look up. Right. But that didn't exist. So he 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 faked he faked this and uh, he. He was never found, uh, but they did find his boat off off the coast of South America and with nobody on it. And they they think he went nuts and he committed suicide. Um, and then there was another person named Bernard Motessier, who, based on all reports, was in the lead and was coming back into the uh, back into the uh, Atlantic Ocean. Right, got got past the uh, southern South America and came back into the Atlantic Ocean. He's in the lead. He's going to be the first person to do this. And he decides, you know what? I'm not going up to England. I'm going to keep going around the world again. <laughs> and he went halfway wow. around the world again. <laughs> and and uh, the person who did win the race, uh, Robert Robin, Robin Knox Johnson, now Sir Robin Knox Johnson, uh, was actually the only contestant to complete the race. So. Wow. Uh, that was a little bit of an aside, but the point being is is that yes, indeed, many of these races have sort of some qualifying because they don't want they don't want people to die. I mean, it, you, you got to know what you're doing. I mean, let's let's just it's just like you know you want to climb Mount Everest, <laughs> you know, yeah, you can you can pay your hundred grand and they'll they'll take you up Mount Everest, but they're gonna take you on some short hikes first to make sure you know mm -hmm. what you're doing. And that guy will say, no, you're not going. So uh, this is no different. 
but yeah, it's it. There's a there's a whole community out there of of solo racers, uh, and and there's various different uh, new embodiments of this Golden Globe race, where where people race around the world solo, and and it's it's pretty remarkable. Unbelievable how hard this must be. What do you think is more critical? Is it the preparation or dealing with the challenges along the way? Like, say, for example, losing a rudder, right? Which happened to Peter. Yeah. Yeah. I I think it's, to me, the harder part is is dealing with the challenges and the stress on, along the way. I mean, in, in preparing, you, I think, you, you sort of, I mean, you sort of have a checklist of stuff. Okay, I got to do these things. I got to... I got to install this piece of equipment on my boat. I got to make sure I'm physically fit. I got to do my exercises. I, I got to raise money or right. Those things to me are sort of concrete uh, milestones that you can sort of check off. Um, it, to me, the hardest thing is dealing with the unexpected, like something breaks on your boat. Now I'm out here by myself. I'm thousands of miles away from anything. Uh, I got to figure out how to solve this problem. And I think that to me is, is can oftentimes be m the most physically and mentally challenging aspect of, of this kind of stuff. Uh, yeah. So it, it to makes me, sense. that's the hard part. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what? I think that's kind of a good, you know, life in general is like that, right? You can, you can pr be prepared and, and this is important and your education and your upbringing and all these things are important. But at the end of the day, we're all going to face these big challenges and it's how we deal with the challenges along the way and how resilient we are and flexible um, and able to adapt and think on our feet that, that really makes a difference um, when I think about it. So it, it's really maybe an allegory for bigger things, but totally yeah. agree. Um, my right. last point that I think is important was I thought this, the organization that Peter works with us Patriot sailing, um, with veterans is really cool. Um, you know, one of the things we've talked about in the past is I always thought that, oh, you know, sailing is really only, you have to be really rich to do it. And it's really exclusionary. And, you know, one of the things that I've learned working with you and talking with you about all these things is that there's lots of opportunities for um to, it, it can be really really inclusive so i was wondering it might be a good note that not only is there u.s patriot sailing for veterans but are there other ways that non-sailors can get into the sailing community out there that maybe we can we can share yeah there sure are i i, I will i will tell you that many uh cities larger metropolitan areas that are attached to a a body of water it doesn't necessarily need to be salt water <laughs> it, can, it can be a lake they have community sailing programs so so along narragansett bay for example there's many of these uh the city of providence has a pretty big one um warren which is a town uh, has has one so there's there's many uh water side communities that have community sailing programs what's a community sailing program that means that uh, you can probably go sailing for free. Um, they will teach you how to sail, and uh, you know they will have boats there that you can take out and sail. Now these are you know little dinghy type boats. It's not a forty-five foot you know boat with a motor on it, um, but it'll get you into sailing. You'll you'll and that's that's how most people start is on little small dinghies as they're called. Um, so I think that's a great way and, and any, almost any community you live in that has a body of water, uh, will have either a public community sailing type of organization that's, that's, you know, uh, run by the city or, or, or some organization and, or they'll also have a sailing club and oftentimes sailing clubs have sort of intro to sailing programs because it's their feeder for membership. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so they will have sort of uh, a program. It may cost you a few small dollars uh, where you can learn how to sail, be exposed to sailing, etc. And then I know we've talked about this in the past. Uh, almost any place where there's sailboats some night of the week it's either you typically either wednesday or thursday night there are sailboat races where a bunch of people are going to go out on that body of water and sail around an island or sail around a buoy and have a race and 
many, many times there's uh, people are looking for crew members and be honest about your experience. Say, look, I know nothing. I'm, I'm here just to learn and, and they'll take you on board and they'll, they'll give you something to do. <laughs> it, it may be just be shift your weight from this side of the boat to that side of the boat, but you'll be out there sailing and you'll be absorbing everything that's going on and you'll be learning in the process. And after two or three races, you'll be doing, you know, stuff, you, you become much more knowledgeable in, in sort of what it takes to sail. And it's a great way to be exposed to that experience and see whether you like it or not. So it might take a little yeah. bit of work on your part and a little bit of digging, but community sailing programs, um, sailing clubs, and these sort of Wednesday, Thursday night races that happen are, are three great ways of uh, getting into it. Yeah, do, you, do you think that Bailey, even if I don't belong to a, to a, a, a yacht club or a, a, you know, any kind of facility, could I walk into, uh, you know, a, a yacht club or a boating club and say, Hey, I, you know, I'm not a member here, but I was wondering if you'd help me find um, an organization or something where I could learn to sail. And would that be okay? And would they know the answer? Uh, I would say that would be hundred percent fine. What's the worst thing they're going to say? No. Hmm. <laughs> they, okay. That's a snobby place. I'll go someplace else. Yeah. <laughs> right? I would never, what, what's the saying? Uh, Groucho Marx. I never want to be a member of a club that would have a person would like have me as a member. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, Classic. but try it. I mean, look on yeah, the internet and it. if not talk to somebody who owns a sailboat yeah. or not, just walk in or one of the boating stores, right? If you go to a boat us right. store or something like that, there'd be people that would know there. <laughs> Um, you know, it's, it's surprising how open and a welcoming of a community that it is. And I think, you know, nine times out of 10, you might find one, catch one person on a bad day or find the one jerk, but I think nine times out of 10, somebody will help you, you know? Absolutely. And most, most marinas and, and most sailing clubs have bulletin boards. Some of them are mm -hmm. online. Some of them are the old fashioned bulletin board, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, with a thumbtack and a piece of paper. And people will say, hey, I'm looking for crew for Wednesday night's races. Uh, and ask that question. And I, I would say 99% of the time, uh, you're going to get an affirmative response and some good information that, that will help you find a, a place to go sailing. Yep. Yeah. So if you have an older kid and you know you don't have a lot of money, I mean, you can access this. You can help your kid figure this out. And I think there's still lots of sailing stuff through schools every now and then too. So, you know, yeah, I think this is something that's more open than people like how I was and my knowledge of sailing when I was a younger person. Um, people can do it. So I don't know how much how many of our listeners are not active sailors but are interested in it. I mean, this is a great reminder that there's resources everywhere. So I don't know. What do you think? On that note, should we wrap it up? Yeah, that's a great way to wrap it up, Mike. Great. Well, listeners, thanks for joining us for yet another episode. And we hope you found our conversation with Peter Gibbon, Gibbons Neff uh, as interesting and thought provoking as we did. Uh, as always, if you have questions about what we've discussed, please feel free to get in touch with us. Our email is sailing the east. That's all one word at gmail.com. And if you enjoyed the podcast, please hit that follow button on your favorite podcasting application. Also, help spread the word about the podcast. Leave us a review. And if you know someone that would be a possible good guest for the show, let us know. We'll reach out to them. Hope to see you out there on the water soon. So until next time, signing off from upstate New York. See you all soon. Sounds great, Bela, from over here in Münster, Germany. See you next time.